Christianity for Beginners. Uh, this is lesson number three in the series uh, entitled The Bible. We're going to talk about the Bible uh, in this uh, lesson. Um, most religions, as you know, have uh, records, holy books, writings, or sayings from their leaders. For Christianity, the source of its history and teachings is the Bible. So in our lesson today, we're going to examine three main things about the Bible, including its content, its history, and its claims. So we start with its contents. It's very difficult to study the content of the Bible without describing some of its history as well. So we're going to review both of these ideas together in order to understand not only what is in the Bible, but how it, comes to be, uh, how it came to be written as well. And so the story of the recording of the Bible as a written record is the story of God's communication with man, basically. So let's take a look at the origin of the Bible. The word Bible comes from the Greek word biblia, which means books. The complete Bible books, number 66, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Uh, to study the Bible origin, we have to begin with the Old Testament, or a better word is the Old Covenant. This term is very useful because it helps us understand what the Bible actually is. It's the details of two covenants or two agreements between God and man, the old agreement or covenant and the new one, which replaces the old. A little bit like a lease. If you lease a house, it's got terms and conditions. You sign, you know, the landlord signs, you have a lease, you have a covenant with them. And then a year goes by and it's time to renew your lease. You sign a new covenant. Some of the same conditions that were in the old are in the new, but you've added some new things in the, in the lease. Well, the same idea, the new covenant, the new testament, retains some of the old, and there are some new ideas uh, in the new one. So let's talk about the old covenant first. Study of the Bible requires us to understand several features of the Old Testament, written in the Hebrew language, which is still uh, used today in uh, Israel. The first person or first man charged with actually, you know, the, the job of recording events and communication from God was Moses, 1500 BC. Uh, Exodus 24, for example, uh, the words of the covenant at Sinai, Exodus 34, the Ten Commandments. Moses is credited with writing and organizing the first five books of the Bible, or what's called the Pentateuch. Uh, Jesus confirms this in Matthew chapter four, verse uh, four. Once God began to use human beings to record his words, this system continued after Moses. Joshua, for example, was the next writer after Moses. We read about that in Joshua 24. And then of course the prophets recorded their history and their prophecies after the time of Joshua. Read about that in Nehemiah chapter eight. So in this way, over a period of 1500 years, approximately 28 writers, completed the 39 books of the Old Testament. Malachi was the last to record in 516 BC. There were no other prophets in Israel until the arrival of John the Baptist. A long period of time, the longest period they suffered without uh, prophets. So all these books were collected and assembled together into one volume by 400 BC. And the Jews had a complete Bible, if you wish, at least 300 years before Christ. Look at the organization of the uh, Old Testament. The Jews had the same Old Testament as we do today, but they organized it in a different way. They divided the Old Testament into three main sections. The law, which included Genesis to Deuteronomy. This of course was the highest importance, the priority for the Jews. Second section were the prophets. The former prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, each had their own volume. And the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, the minor prophets, all 12 of those, all of these were in one volume. And then what they called the holy writings, the holy writings, poetry, history, 
Job, Psalms, Proverbs, all these books, Esther, Nehemiah, Daniel. They organized these books into 24 books instead of our uh, division today of 39 books. So you had the Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy, five books, the prophets, the former and the latter, four books each, and the writings of poetry and history, 11 books, for a total of 24 books. That was the way that the Hebrew Bible uh, was divided. Today, we have the same books, but we divide them differently. The Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy, five books. History, from Joshua to Esther, 12 books. Poetry, from Job to Song of Solomon, five books. Major prophets, Isaiah to Daniel, five longer books, they're called major prophets because they're longer, the books are longer. And the minor prophets, Hosea to Malachi, 12 books. Call them the minor prophets, not because they were less important, but because their writings were not as long. And so there are 12 of those books for a total of 39 books. Same material, it's exactly the same material, except it was just chopped up and, and organized in a different way. The Old Testament uh, story, of course, how many books and, and laws uh, and, and how they were divided does not tell us what the Old Testament is about. Even though the material was collected and written over a period of 1500 years and recorded by more than 25 different authors, the Old Testament of the Bible tells only one unbroken story. And that is God's relationship with mankind and in particular with a certain group within mankind. Now in, in, in history, in human history, there, there are a lot of things going on in human history. Nations rising and falling, inventions, you know, periods of time. And yet through all of this, the Bible is just you know, focused in on one group mainly. It talks about what's going on peripherally around the Jews, you know, a little bit of world history here and there, but basically it's laser focused on this, this small group of people throughout that time. In Genesis, we have an account of the creation of the world and how the environment, society, and human beings came to be in their present state. A ruined natural world, a dysfunctional society, and a human race doomed to die. We find out why that happened in the book of Genesis. In Genesis, we also read about a man called Abraham, chosen by God to be the head of a nation through whom God would offer salvation to all men. The rest of the Old Testament books describe the growth and the development of this man's family from a wandering tribe to a powerful and wealthy nation called Israel. Most of the Old Testament books will contain information on the war, we're talking about Israel now, about their wars and their conquests, their politics, their religion, their moral codes, their poetry, their general history. It will also contain prophecies or predictions, if you wish, of future events that will happen to their nation as well as the appearance and work of the Savior originally promised to Abraham. Although complicated to read at times because we may not be familiar with the history and the social customs spoken of, the Old Testament is really one story describing God's relationship with the Jewish people and their role in preparing a cultural and historical stage on which the Savior would appear. The Savior had to be something. What, what culture would he be? What nationality would he be? What, what language would he speak? Well, God didn't choose an existing culture to bring his son into the world. He created a culture. He picked one person and said, out of that one person, I'm going to create a whole nation a nation, a culture, a religion with laws and history unique to itself, whose only purpose was to form a historical stage upon which his son would appear in history, okay? Talk about the New Testament. New Testament, like the Old Testament, is also a story given in various books. The story it tells is of the life and ministry, the death, the burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the subsequent spread uh, of his teachings by his followers. 
the apostles who established the Christian church in the first century. There were many accounts written of Jesus' life, but the official or the inspired books referred to as the New Testament canon has only 27 books. I'll explain how these came to be in a moment, but the division of the New Testament books is as follows. You have the Gospels, four of these, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are the eyewitness accounts of the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. One history book, the book of Acts, talks about the Acts of the Apostles as they established the church, the Christian church. The Pauline epistles, 13 of these, 13 letters written by Paul. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon. The general, what are called the general epistles. There are eight of those, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, written by various apostles and the disciple of apostles. And then one book of prophecy, the book of Revelation, 27 books in all. Now aside from the Gospels, which are accounts of Jesus' life, and the book of Acts, which is the history of the establishment of the church, most of these other letters were written to churches in order to teach and encourage them in the practice of their Christian faith. You know, Paul, for example, is answering questions. He goes in and establishes a church and then leaves. They have questions. They want to know what's going on. How do we do this? How do we handle that problem? And so most of his epistles are letters to churches and some individuals, but mostly teaching about how to do things and also uh, encouragements to uh, remain, remain faithful. They applied and completed the original teachings of Christ. What is of great interest to many, however, is how this ancient material came to us today in this number and in our own language. How did we go from Paul writing you know, uh, in the first century uh, to this here written in English that I can read? How did we get from there to here? Well, that has to do with what's called the New Testament canon. Many books, of course, were written about the life of Jesus and several books were written by the apostles and their disciples. How did they decide which books actually belonged in the New Testament? The books that made up the New Testament are called the canon. The canon from a Greek word which means measuring rod. So they're the books that measure up the canon. In other words, when the early church examined all the material that was written about Jesus, how did they decide which books belonged in the New Testament canon? Out of the hundreds of books and letters, how did they narrow it down to 27? I can understand if they narrowed it down to 2700, <laughs> but how did they get it down to 27? Well, there were three main factors that led uh, the early church to form the New Testament canon and preserve it in one book. In the beginning, the church did not um, uh, have a high regard for keeping the letters of the apostles and the disciples. I mean, the apostles were alive, they were producing many letters, so there was no urgency in preserving them. Uh, there was a lot of in, uh, written material that was being produced, so no one thought that they needed to keep any of it. They also thought that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime, so the need for preserving the material for the future was not there. They thought Jesus is coming back. I mean, Paul had to say to the Thessalonians, you guys, you guys gotta get to work. You know, if, you, if you don't work, you won't eat. Well, the problem of not working wasn't just laziness, it was like, Jesus is coming, you know, why build the house? Why get excited? The Lord's coming, let's just, we'll wait. And so uh, that lack of urgency also was felt by church leaders who were not preserving any of the materials either. But then certain events took place that required them to begin collecting and preserving the teachings of the Lord and the teachings of the apostles things that happened that kind of pushed them to begin 
this collection. The first of which was the Canon of Marcion. The Canon of Marcion in 140 AD. Marcion was a false teacher who rejected the entire Old Testament. He accepted only 10 of the epistles of Paul and only a part of Luke's gospel, but rejected everything else. And he began circulating his little personal group, if you wish, of letters as the official canon. And so the early church was forced to decide which of the writings were authoritative and which ones should they collect and which one uh, should they circulate. So this, this began to roll somewhere around 170 AD. Second problem was persecution. Under the Roman emperor Diocletian, it was a capital offense to possess a copy, any copy of the Christian scriptures. This brought up the question, well, which scriptures are worth dying for? <laughs> I don't mind dying for the Lord, but I, I don't want to die for a, a fake letter, you know? the epistle of Bob, you know, I'm not ready, I'm not ready to be <laughs> beheaded for the, the, the epistle of Bob, all right? And so many uninspired historical books were burned and only the most precious, most accepted works were kept. And then thirdly, the codex form appeared. Codex is the book form, this is this, this form here, books with pages, that was the codex form, where several pages were placed together instead of using a scroll. So when the codex form became popular, it brought up the question, which books should be grouped together in one volume, in a book? This motivated them to keep only the books that were acceptable in a single volume. But the main question for the early church was, which are the inspired books? There was no meeting you know, where they reviewed all of the material and then they made a decision as to which, you know, which made it in and which didn't. That's not how it worked. On the contrary, the early church simply accepted those works that had already been recognized as inspired throughout the centuries, but had not yet been collected and organized into one set, okay? This was finally done in 367 AD, and the 27 books confirmed by the Council of Carthage later in that century has remained the same since without a single change. So we've had, we've had the same Old Testament that we have today, okay? We had the same thing 400 years or 300 years before Christ. And we've had the same New Testament without any changes since the third century. No changes, same thing, same material. But in collecting the books for inclusion in the New Testament canon, the early church was guided by certain principles. Number one, the principle of authorship. If a man was inspired when he spoke, well then his writings were also considered inspired. For this reason, the writings of the apostles were quickly accepted into the canon. Also, the men associated with the apostles were also accepted. For example, Luke, because of his association with Paul. Mark, because of his association with Peter and with Paul. James, who was called the brother of the Lord and an apostle, Galatians chapter one. This of course allowed the gospels and the letters of Paul and Peter and James and John uh, to be a natural selection. That was easy, it was easy. Those were easy to, to collect, all right? A second principle was uh, value of the book. In some cases a book had a name attached to it, but it did not read like a, an authentic New Testament book. Many uninspired authors tried to gain an audience by putting the name of an apostle on their book. So Bob writes a book and he calls it the epistle of Peter because he knows if he says the apostle of Bob, it's not going anywhere, right? But if he, if he calls it the, you know, the, the epistle of Peter, well now he's got a chance to get his material uh, circulated. And so scholars tell us that 
it was fairly easy to distinguish between inspired and fake when you actually read the documents themselves. For example, in the, a thing called the Gospel of Thomas, uh, in that gospel or in that writing, um, Jesus made sparrows out of mud and he was rebuked for doing this on the Sabbath. And he said, rise up and fly away. And the birds came to life and they flew away. Well, you know, nice story, you know, but not, not the kind of gravitas that we're expecting from the Lord and the type of miracles that he performed. In another one of these uh, books, the, there's a story where uh, Jesus uh, working with his father, Joseph, miraculously stretches a board to be long enough you know, to fit uh, what they were building. Again, you know, yeah, somehow it doesn't quite match the picture. You know? In other words, when comparing the writings, it was fairly easy to tell the real from the fake. The inspired books had harmony of thought, harmony of purpose and style, there were no contradictions, and they were accurate historically as well as theologically. That was what was important. A third factor for inclusion was circulation. The church did not decide which ones were suitable and which ones were not. They merely confirmed and collected those books which had traditionally been accepted by all the churches but had never been collected into one volume before. Everyone agreed that Luke had written Luke and Luke had written Acts and Luke Acts circulated as a you know, compound letter in the early century. And everybody believed and agreed that it was by Luke and it was about, P, uh, about Paul, and, you know, uh, but it had never been included with Peter's epistles and Paul's epistles and, and so on and so forth. So they, they took material that they knew and that had been accepted for decades as authentic by the church and merely collected it all into one, uh, one uh, volume, all right? Uh, so no new book was introduced. Only those letters and volumes that had wide circulation and acceptance after long ages of study and review. The canon was confirmed 300 years after the first writings began to be circulated. And for, the, for that period of time, that's pretty fast because things moved very slowly in those days. We also believe that God was guiding and protecting the process in which his word was recorded and preserved. You know. uh, let's talk about some translations, shall we? The Old Testament was written in the Hebrew language, most of it, some small parts in Aramaic. Uh, there came a time when the Jews could not speak Hebrew because of the Greek influence. And so a translation of the Hebrew Old Testament was made in the Greek language. It was called the Septuagint. It was called the Septuagint because 70, 70 scholars worked on that particular translation. During New Testament times, the people spoke Aramaic which was an ancient language of the region. However, the books and letters of the New Testament were not written in this language. Uh, it was written in the common form of Greek, what's called Koine Greek, which was the universal language of the period. Just like now the universal language in the world is English. In those days, the universal language was Greek, okay? Common Greek. The Greek form remained the standard as copies were made from the original and distributed for the first several centuries. There are in existence today 5,357 Greek manuscripts of portions of the New Testament that scholars work with. Uh, if, you work, if you look at comparisons, uh, there are more Bible manuscripts and portions of manuscripts that exist for the New Testament than there are manuscripts that exist for Shakespeare or for the Greek tragedies. Nobody doubts Shakespeare lived. Nobody doubts Shakespeare wrote those things. And yet there's less physical evidence for Shakespeare's writing than there are for the New Testament. Thousands and thousands of fragments and portions of the New Testament uh, copies that were made. Uh, with time, the Greek was translated into Latin and other languages, but these translations were always made from the original Greek manuscripts. And I need to just pause for a second here to comment here. <clears throat> one of the uh, 
You know, one of the major uh, arguments against the accuracy of the Bible is the, uh, you know what they call the telephone argument? Telephone argument, you know, you, you play that game sometimes with, with kids at a party. You, you tell a story to one person, then that person tells a story to another person, then to another and to another. You, know, you do 10 people and then at the end of the game, you know, the first person gets up and, and, and says, this is the story that I told, and you have the 10th person get up, and this is the, the story once it's gone around 10 times, you know, 10 translations. And people think that the Bible has been translated that way, you know, from, from Greek to Latin, from Latin to, to, to German, from German to Spanish, from Spanish to French, from French to English, but that's not how it's been translated. Every time there's a translation, the, the translators always go back to the original manuscripts. And so the, the French version of the New Testament has been translated from the very same documents that the English translation of the New Testament. So the scholars always go back to the original manuscripts to create their uh, translations. Uh, Latin was the language of the western portion of the Roman Empire, and as Christianity spread westward from its original home, where Greek was the dominant language, uh, a new version of the Bible was, um, was developed. In 404 AD, a new Latin version of the Bible was produced by Jerome, who was an early church uh, leader. His translation from the Greek to Latin was called the Latin Vulgate, Latin Vulgate. This became the standard uh, version for study and church life in the Middle Ages. Various translations were made into what, what are called common languages of the time. From the fifth through to the 14th centuries, these included translations into Gothic or Syrian, Slavic, English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. By the 14th century, there was a renewal uh, in interest in the Greco-Roman world and its languages and uh, its literature. Uh, this was brought about by the Renaissance. And so during the Renaissance, there was a, a great interest in ancient languages, uh, you know, ancient languages like Greek all right, and Hebrew. And so uh, 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 this produced a greater effort to examine the Greek language. This new trend led to a revival of the study of Greek and Hebrew languages, as well as a study of ancient biblical manuscripts. <clears throat> this zeal to produce new Bible versions in common languages translated directly from the original Greek and Hebrew was helped along by a new religious movement called the Reformation. See, all these historical things, you know, the perfect storm working together, uh, intellectual interest in Greek and Hebrew, theological religious interest in the church uh, and in the gospel itself, you know, and these things uh, merge. Uh, with the invention of the printing press, Gutenberg's printing press in 1436, the technology to actually produce mass quantities of Bibles in different languages was realized. I mean, we buy a Bible for a buck. Right, the bargain bin over at Mardell's, you know, a dollar, you get yourself a Bible, Pfft, nothing to it. You know? Only rich people had Bibles, only kings and, and the bishop, these people were the ones that had Bibles in those days. But with the advent of the printing press, the Bible was now available to the masses. It's interesting to note that the very first book to be printed on Gutenberg's new invention was the Latin Vulgate version of the Bible. And that was printed somewhere between 1452 and 1456. This Bible was called the 42 line Bible. Guess why? Well, because every page had 42 lines, 42 lines. Uh, that particular Bible still exists today and it can be seen at the Gutenberg Museum in Mainz in Germany, which is near Frankfurt. I went there once to Frankfurt. The, um, Invention of the printing press helped spread the Bible in various languages throughout the world. The earliest known uh, English translation was in 700 AD. Uh, a and, and, and it was a Latin version with English notes between the lines. The first complete English translation was done by John Wycliffe in 1382 and he was imprisoned for his efforts. 
the powers, the religious powers that be did not want the Bible to become you know, uh, accessible to the uh, masses. Um, the first printed English Bible was William Tyndale in 1526. Uh, today, Tyndale Publishing, very large publishing house. Uh, there were many translations as the science of translation and ar archeology span developed. Major translation, uh, of course, was the King James Bible, 1611, and it became the authorized version for English speaking people for many years, still a very popular Bible today. There are many translations um, and versions that have appeared over the years. Uh, the Revised Standard Version, the American Standard, New American Standard, New International Version, New Living Translate, each of these have a different style. People say, well, what's, so di what's different about these? Well, for example, the, uh, the Revised Standard uh, Version, uh, very good Old Testament uh, translation, uh, but the New Testament translation is, is awkward. Uh, the American Standard was the best word per word translation. But the problem was the English was awkward to read. It was clunky, it was chunky to read. Uh, if anybody who speaks two languages understands this idea, if you try to, to translate something directly from one language to another word per word, it doesn't work very well you know, in the other language if it's word per word. And, and the American Standard Version was an attempt at doing that. The new American Standard was a correction of that. It, it took the American standard, best word per word, and it kind of smoothed it out, made it uh, much easier to read and to understand a great study. New American Standard is a great study Bible. Uh, New International Version uh, is a Bible uh, where the English flows uh, very well, uh, a kind of a, a people's Bible, if you wish, it became very popular. A uh, new living translation is one of the newer ones using the easy to read modern English. And its goal is to give the most exact meaning using today's uh, English. So there are many other, uh, we could spend all night talking about all the translation, but these are some of the uh, major ones that have come along. Uh, some people say, well, you just can't trust any translation because translators can make mistakes from the Greek. Of the thousands of translations in different languages, there are no major doctrines, persons, commands that are in conflict or in question. If there are mistakes, they are punctuation mistakes or the names of places or locations which are obscure in the original language. The percentage of error in today's Greek text is less than 1%. Less than 1%. In other words, don't worry about not understanding the Hebrew or the Greek. When you are reading the English version, you are reading 99 and 9 tenths percent of what is written in the Greek and the Hebrew. You can trust your Bible because it is accurate as to what God is saying. What I'm amazed at all the time is that when I'm reading Isaiah, I'm reading the exact Isaiah, the exact words and phrases that the Jews read, that Jesus himself read. You know, it says that Jesus went to the synagogue and he read Isaiah. I'm reading the same Isaiah. And uh, many archeological discoveries have uh, proven this. Uh, some Bible claims. What does the Bible claim? Uh, so we've looked at the context of the Bible, excuse me, the content of the Bible, how it came to be written, how it's organized as well as the various translations that have been produced. A bit of a thumbnail sketch of the Bible, if we can do that all in one lesson. One final point I want to consider, and it's what does the Bible claim? In other words, what does it say about itself? Well, very simply, the Bible claims that it is inspired, meaning that God is the author of the Bible. Humans simply wrote what he wanted and guided them to write. All scripture, Second uh, Timothy 3, 16 says, all scripture is inspired by God. That's not a lot of words here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six words. Only six words. But the Bible says of itself, all scripture is inspired by God. So whenever someone comes to you and says, okay, well, what Paul wrote here, that's not really inspired. That was his own thinking. And I've heard that from many people. 
And I say to them, yes, but it says all scripture is inspired by God. See what I'm saying? And so uh, the Bible says this about itself. Um, in 2 Peter uh, 1 verse uh, 21, I don't know if I've got this, yes. In 2 Peter 1 verse 21, he says, uh, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now, it's easy to make claims, but why do Christians believe this claim that the Bible is not just a book written by you know, good holy men, but is in fact fully inspired by God? Well, there are a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons, but I'm look at three briefly as we kind of close out our lessons. First of all, I believe it's inspired because of its ability to survive. Despite every effort to discredit its teaching and claims by government, religious organizations, philosophers and skeptics of every kind for almost 2000 years, the Bible has survived intact. And despite constant attacks, it continues to be the most translated, most printed, most read book in the world and in all of history. Of course, you would expect no less from a book that says that it comes from God. Of course, it's the most read book. It comes from God. <laughs> Another reason Christians believe the Bible is from God, it's uniqueness. You know, one reason why many religions come and go is that their teachings are demonstrated to be false or they become irrelevant in the modern world. But the Christian religion and the Bible as its source is unique among religious books. Unique in its depth and insight compared to any other secular or religious book. And I say this not of myself, scholars agree. Scholars agree. Even if they don't believe the content, they agree that its content is deeper and, and, and more vast than any of the other religious uh, holy books. It's unique in its unity. Think now, 66 books, 1500 years to write, 40 different authors, and yet it is perfectly fitted together without contradiction, telling a single story seamlessly. I mean, we can't even get, the, we can't even get an accurate report of what the president said at a conference an hour ago, <laughs> let alone 1500 years ago. Unique in its uh, universality in that it is read and followed by every culture and language and perfectly adaptable in every time period, ancient or modern. You know, where uh, many Christians are mourning the, the, the assassination of Christians, right, in Sri Lanka. Their culture is, uh, the Sri Lankan culture is so different from American culture. I mean, we wouldn't recognize it. And yet there are Christians there they became Christians using the same book that we became Christians. Even though their culture and language is different, their faith is exactly the same. Why? Because of the Bible and its ability to relate to any culture, any time frame. Only a book with a divine source could lay claim to such unique features. There are other reasons to believe that the Bible's claim is, you know, is inspired of God, but one last one I'd like to, to touch on just for this lesson, and that is fulfilled prophecy. Humans cannot accurately predict future events. To be able to do so is a sign of divine power, but to do so 100% of the time is a sure proof that God is at work. The Bible contains not one or two, hundreds of such prophecies. Events, people, situations described by prophets and kings and teachers that were fulfilled years or even centuries later. Take for example Isaiah 44, 28. Isaiah says, or he prophesies, it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built and of the temple your foundations will be laid. So that's Isaiah who is talking, you know, use, you know God is talking through Isaiah and he's talking about a guy, a king, Cyrus, who's going to come and build up Jerusalem. You know, nothing special there, right? Only one little thing we have to note. 
Isaiah lived in 700 BC. Cyrus, the king that he named, lived 100 years later. And history records this. The prophet names him, gives his position, and exactly what he was going to do. And we know from history that all of this took place. <laughs> That's calling it you know, exactly historically. Another one, just from the New Testament this time. This is Jesus, it says they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was walking on ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the 12 aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. Saying, behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him and three days later, he will rise again. Accurate prediction, fulfillment of future events is a definite sign that a supernatural force is at work. Only God can do this. And he has done it in the Bible hundreds of times. This is an example. Jesus saying to his apostles exactly what was going to take place in his future. In addition to this, the Bible is the only book, the only book or holy book that contains accurately fulfilled prophecies. In other words, in one part of the book, at a certain time period in history, a prophet makes a prediction, okay? And then you keep reading the Bible as it tells the story throughout history, and then you know, 200 or 300 years later or whatever, that prophecy that that prophet made over here is described being fulfilled over here, historically. The Bible is the only holy book that contains this type of thing. No other book. No other book contains fulfilled prophecy. Only the Bible, and why would no other book contain fulfilled prophecy? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the question answers itself, right? So if the Bible is inspired as it claims to be, you would expect that it would contain features only possible through divine power. And of course, the argument is fulfilled prophecy can only be done through divine power. Okay, well that's our lesson reviewing the content, the history, and the claims of the Bible, the book that Christians use as their guide. In our next lesson, we're going to uh, focus um, on Jesus Christ, who is the focus of the Bible records. We said, what is the Bible about you know, historically? Well, the Bible's about Jesus, and we're going to look at that, answering the question, who is Jesus Christ? Well, okay, thank you very much for your attention. That's our class for today.